What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Hit the like button, hit the share button, hit the subscribe button, and let's get started. So I, look, I wasn't going to do this. I was going to do this tomorrow, but I, I decided to do it on a Sunday night because I got somebody who's going to come in tomorrow and we're going to have a dialogue about strategy and logistics. But I just wanted to talk about power and what power looks like between strong people or strong nations and nations that are not all that strong. And the kind of reasoning that goes through the statesmen of strong states and statesmen of weak states. And I'm gonna do this by looking at some ancient dude. His name is Thucydides. Now this guy, um, he was an Athenian historian. He was a general. And uh, he wrote a book called The History of the Peloponnesian War. And it basically recounts the fifth century BC war between Sparta and Athens. Everybody knows about Sparta and Athens, right? So this war lasted until about 14, well, no, excuse me, 411 BC. Now Thucydides has basically been named the father of scientific history by people who accept what he has to say. And he's trying to be an, imp an impartial and an objective presenter of the facts as it pertains to history, I mean, in, in power relations between states. He's also the father of what people consider to be political realism, how individuals behave, right, and the outcome of relations between states that's basically mediated by and predicated on fear and self-interest. That's what it is. And this could be, you know, instructive for African Americans. And you'll come to see how in a second. What's up? What's up now? But before I get started all the way, I want to shout out Seven Coast Dojo, Ronan Martin, Shop, Shop Talk Live, WPR1, Roguish the Billmonger, I Care, the Nameless Protagonist, Force Windu, Lady Miss Thing Green, BGS Ivmore, and Marvin Battle. I want to give them a shout out before I even get started. Those are my members, and so I got to shout them out. So, peace out, Dovetail. Peace out, Leroy Honeycup. What's up, St. Louis Sand? So this debate is called the Melian debate. Now, I, it's a debate between the Melians and the Athenians. Now, Melos is this little small island in the Cretan Sea. And it's surrounded by other islands, but these people in the other islands that occupied them, they were part of the Athenian empire. But Melos wasn't. Milos was a colony of the Spartans. But during the war, during the Peloponnesian War, which was a war between Sparta and Athens, the Melians remained neutral. It didn't send the Spartans any arms, any men, or any boats. So they remained neutral. That's how they wanted to roll. They wanted to roll neutral. Like, we don't have anything to do with, uh, you know, taking sides. We're just gonna sit back and we doing us. You do y'all, we, we do us. LaShawn, I ain't gonna go silverback tonight. I'm just trying to be the professor tonight, but uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows? But I'm gonna share the screen so you can, you can read this with me and you can see it with me as I go through it. And, and it's just a statement to how politics really takes place between countries or nations that have a lot of power and those that do not. That's what this is all about. Okay. So I'm going to share this screen.
and I'm pretty sure you can see it now. I'm going to take myself out of the picture and just make it all out. Well, I think I'm going to keep myself there. No, that's not what I want. I, I'm going to just keep it like that. Okay. So I'm going to go through this dialogue. And after I go through the dialogue, well, while I'm going through the dialogue, I'm going to kind of explain what the hell is happening here, right? So the Athenians, basically, they land on Milos. And they come to tell them people, they say, look, since we're not allowed to speak to your people, less than truth, a multitude should be deceived by seductive and unanswerable arguments, which they would hear set forth in a single uninterrupted oration. So since you not having us speak before your people and you met with a small amount of people right here, you who are sitting here may as well make assurance yet sure. Let us have no set speeches at all. But do you reply to each statement of which you disapprove and criticize it at once? Say, first of all, how do you like this mode of proceeding? And the Melians say, the quiet interchange of explanations is a reasonable thing, and we don't object to that. But your warlike movements, which are apparent, not only to our fears, but to our eyes, seem to belie your words. We see that although you may reason with us, you mean to be our judges. And that at the end of the discussion, if the justice of our cause prevail and we therefore refuse to yield, we may expect war. If we're convinced, uh, convinced by what you have to say, slavery. And then the Athenians say, no, but if you're only going to argue from fancies about the future, or if you meet with any other purpose than that of looking your circumstances straight in the face and saving your city, we ain't got nothing else to say. But if the good of your city is what you want, then we'll go ahead with this. And then the Melians say, well, it's an excusable and natural thing that men in our position should neglect no argument and no view which may present itself. But we admit that this conference has met to consider the question of our preservation. And so we won't let an argument get between us and we'll uh, allow this to go down the way you want it. Okay, so we agree to this back and forth exchange. Okay, so the Athenians say, okay, well then, we're not going to use any fine words. We're not going to hit you in any lofty speeches. We're not going to go out of our way to prove at length that we have a right to rule you because we overthrew the Persians, which is what they did, or that we attack you now because we're suffering any injury at your hands because you haven't done anything to us. We should not convince you if we said all that, nor must you expect to convince us by arguing that although you're a colony of the Spartans, which is another name for the Lacedaemonians. So I'm going to replace the Spartans because that's what it refers to. They say, nor must you convince us by arguing that although you're a colony of the Spartans, you have not taken part in their expeditions and that you haven't done us any wrong. So the fact that you haven't done us any wrong is not really going to convince us either. But you and we should say that we what we really think and aim only at what's possible. For we both alike know that in the discussion of human fair affairs, the question of justice only enters where there is equal power to enforce it. And that the powerful do what they can and the weak grant what they must. Now, that's a hell of a statement right there. I don't know if you caught that, but that's a hell of a statement. You hear gangsters say this shit all the time. Gangsters say, we do what we want to do. You do what you can. You do what you can, but we do what we want. You want to talk about justice? That only enters in the equation when there's roughly some sort of power equality amongst the people involved or the parties involved. If there's no relative equality in power, there is no justice. The powerful do what they can. The weak do what they have to do. And then the Melians say, well, then, since you set aside justice, invite us only to speak of expediency or what, you know, is pragmatic. In our judgment, it is certainly expedient that you should respect the principle, which you know is for the common good. They're talking about justice. 
that to every man in parable uh, in peril, a reasonable claim should be accounted a claim of right, and that any plea which he is disposed to urge, even if failing of the point a little, should help his cause. So they're like, we, we got to use justice. We got to talk in terms of justice. And then they try to convince them to use justice or to think about justice. And they say, well, your interest in this principle is great as ours. In as much as you, if you fall, will incur the heaviest vengeance and will be the most terrible example to mankind. So like if you lose or you know, if y'all get weak, then you're gonna wanna make a claim about justice. That's what the millions are trying to convince the Athenians. And then the Athenians say, look, if our empire falls or should it fall, it's not an event to which we look forward with dismay. Like if we die, we die. If our shit gets conquered, it's conquered. For ruling states such as the Spartans are not cruel to their vanquished enemies. So if we lose the Sparta, they, they ain't gonna do shit to us. With the Spartans, however, we are not now arguing. The real danger is from our many subject states who may of their own motion rise up and overcome us, their masters. But this is a danger which you may leave to us. And we will now endeavor to show that we have come in the interest of our empire. And that in what we are about to say, we're only seeking the preservation for your city. For we want to make you ours with the least trouble to ourselves. And it's for the interest of us both that you should not be destroyed. So in other words, they're like, look, if our empire falls, the Spartans ain't going to do shit to us for real. They're not going to treat us that harshly. But we're not talking about the Spartans. We're talking about you. You are neutral in an area where we run shit. You might rise up and try to overtake us. Or whatever the case may be, man, you got to give it up. We're talking to you right now. We have an interest in you doing what we say. You do what we say, you survive. You don't do as we say, well, and then the media say, it may be your interest to be our masters, but how can it be ours to be your slaves? And then the Athenians say, to you, the game will be that by submission, you will avoid the worst and you shall be richer for your preservation. And then Amelia say, but must we be your enemies? Will you not receive us as friends if we are neutral and remain at peace with you? And the Athenians say, no. Your enmity is not half so mischievous to us as your friendship. For the one is in the eyes of our subjects an argument of our power, the other of our weakness. So if we, if, if we are your enemies, that shows us that we're powerful. The more you are trying to remain neutral and act like our friends, that makes us look weak. So then the Melians say, but are your subjects really unable to distinguish between states in which you have no concern and those which are chiefly your own colonies and in some cases have revolted and been subdued by you? And then the Athenians say, why? They no doubt that both of them have a good deal to say for themselves on the score of justice but they think that states like yours are left free because they're able to defend themselves and that we don't attack because we dare not. So your subjection will give us an increase in security as well as an extension of our empire, for we are masters of the sea and you who are islanders and insignificant islanders at that must not be allowed to get past us, man. And then Amelia say, but don't you recognize another danger? For once more, since you drive us from the plea of justice and press upon us your doctrine of expediency, what's pragmatic, we must show you what is for our interest. And if it be yours also, may hope to convince you. Will you not be making enemies of all who are now neutral? When they see how you're treating us, they will expect you to someday turn against them. And if so, are you not strengthening the enemies whom you already have? and bringing upon you others who, if they could help, would never dream of being your enemies at all? And then the Athenians say, look, man, we don't consider our really dangerous enemies to be any of the peoples inhabiting the mainland who, securing their freedom, 
may defer indefinitely any measures of precaution which they take against us. But islanders who, like you, happen to be under no control and, and who may already be irritated by necessity of submission to our empire, these are our real enemies. For they're the most reckless and the most likely to bring themselves as well as us into danger, which they can't but foresee. And then Amelia say, surely then, if you and your subjects will brave all this risk, you to preserve your empire and they to be quit of it, how base and cowardly would it be in us who retain our freedom not to do and suffer anything rather than be your slaves? And then the Athenians say, well, not so if you sit back and think about it. For you're not fighting against equals, man, to whom you cannot yield without disgrace. But you are taking counsel whether or not you shall resist an overwhelming force. The question is not one of honor, but what makes sense, what's smart. You can't beat us. You, it's not smart for you to fight us, man. And then Amelia say, but we know that the fortune of war is sometimes impartial and not always on the side of numbers. If we yield now, all is over. But if we fight, we might, there's a hope we might stand up right. And then the Athenians really go in here. They say, look, hope is good. It's a good comforter in the hour of danger. And when men have something else to depend on, although hurtful, she is not ruinous. But when her spendthrift nature is induced, them to stake all, everything, they see her as she is in the moment of their fall, and not until then. While the knowledge of her hope might enable them to be aware of her, she never fails. You are weak, and a single turn of the scale might be your ruin. Don't be deluded. Avoid the error of which so many are guilty, who, although they might still be saved, if they would take the natural means, when visible grounds of confidence forsake them, have recourse to the invisible, to prophecies and oracles and prayers and shit, which ruin men by the hopes which they inspire in them. So in other words, the Athenians like, man, cut all that bullshit about hope, man. Hope is cool to them until they're about to fall. And then they realize that hope had failed them to begin with. So then the Melians say, we know only too well how hard the struggle must be against your power and against fortune if she does not mean to be impartial. Nevertheless, we do not despair of fortune, for we hope to stand as high as you in the favor of heaven because we are righteous. And you against whom we contend are not righteous. We are satisfied that our deficiency in power will be compensated by the aid of our allies, the Spartans. They cannot refuse to help us if only because. We are their kinsmen and for the sake of their own honor. And therefore, our confidence is not so utterly blind as you think. And then the Athenians say, look, man, as for the gods and hope and all that and prayers, we expect to have quite as much of their favor as you do. For we are not doing or claiming anything which goes beyond common opinion. For of the gods we believe and of men we know, that by a law of their nature, wherever they can rule, they will. That's important right there, man. Fuck what the gods say. The gods are all this shit about we right and y'all wrong. And look, the gods got us just like you say the gods got you. So we can leave all this righteous shit out of the picture, man. Because the gods have made a law of nature and the law of nature is wherever a man can rule, he will. This law wasn't made by us. We weren't the first to have acted on it, but we did inherit it and we shall bequeath it to all time. And we know that you and all mankind, if you was as strong as we were, you would do as we're doing. So much for the gods. We told you why we expect to stand as high in their good opinion as you. And then as the Spartans, when you imagine that out of the very shame they will assist you, we admire the innocence of your idea, but we don't envy you the stupidity of it. You see, the Spartans are exceedingly virtuous amongst themselves, according to their national standard of morality, but in respect to dealing with other people? Although many things might be said, they can be described in a few words. 
of all men whom we know, they are the most notorious for identifying what is pleasant with what is honorable and what is expedient with what is just. But how inconsistent is such a character with your present blind hope of deliverance? And then the Melians say, that's the very reason why we trust them. They will look to their interest and therefore will not be willing to betray the Melians, who are their own colonists, lest they should be distrusted by their friends in the Hellas, which is the land of the Greeks, and play into the hands of their enemies. And then the Athenians say, but do you not see the path of expediency as safe, whereas justice and honor involve danger and practice? And such dangers that the Spartans seldom care to face, they ain't gonna come to your aid, bruh. And then the Melians say, on the other hand, we think whatever perils there may be, they will be ready to face them for our sake and will consider dangerous, uh, excuse me, and consider danger less dangerous where we are concerned. For if they need our aid, we are close at hand and they can better trust our loyal feeling because we are their kinsmen. And the Athenians say, yes, but what encourages men? who are invited to join a conflict is clearly not the goodwill of those who summon them to their side, but a decided superiority in real power. So if you call on somebody to help you fight, you don't call on them because of goodwill, you call on, call on them because they got that thing. They gonna put in their work. Not because of some friendly chummy shit. You ain't gonna call no lame to the fight. You gonna call somebody strong to the fight. And they say to this, no men look more kingly than the Spartans. They don't look for weak people. They look for the strong. So little confidence have they in their own resources that they only attack their neighbors when they have a whole bunch of people behind them. And therefore they are not likely to find their way by themselves to an island when we are the masters of the sea. So in other words, dude, y'all all alone, man. Either give it up or no, man. If you don't give it up, we're going to kill you, bro. We're going to kill you. So look, I'm going to go through this, man. I'm going to finish this because it ain't, it ain't too much more. It's just a little bit more, okay? So this is what the Melians say in response to that claim. But they may send their allies, and the Cretan Sea is a large place. And the masters of the sea will have more difficulty in overtaking vessels which want to escape than the pursued in escaping. If the attempts should fail, they may invade Attica itself and find their way to allies of yours whom Brasidas did not reach. And then you will have to fight, not for the conquest of a land of which you have no concern, but nearer to your home, for the preservation of your confederacy and of your own territory. So all the Melians are doing is just trying to explain why these people shouldn't overtake them. The Athenians are telling them, look, man, you keep making appeals to justice. Justice only exists around relative power equals. You're not a relative power equal. You're not going to win. Give it up. And then they talk about hope. And then the Athenians say, look, you might have some hope that you might win, but come on, man, don't be foolish. Hope seems to flee at that very moment when you think it should have kicked in, then you realize how stupid it was for you to have hope to begin with. Forget the hope, man. Do what's best for yourselves. Don't talk to the gods either. Don't talk about gods. Because God is just as much on our side as he is on your side, or the gods in this case. So no appeals to cosmic justice, no appeals to hope, no appeals to what's right, because rightness or justice only really actually exists amongst power equals. The powerful do what they can, and the weak do what they have to do. Thank you, James Washington, for becoming a member. Appreciate that. I got 54 people listening. And I ain't expect to have a whole bunch of people on a Sunday night either. I just wanted to get this in because a lot of times, what do we do when we talk about our condition in the place where we are now? What kind of language do we use? We use language about justice. We use language about what's right. 
We talk about fairness. We talk about what's righteous, what's fair, what's just. But do you know what ended up happening to the millions? Because the millions basically, they told them that they was going to fight. Guess what happened to them, man? What you think happened to them? I can tell you what happened to them, bro. The Athenians basically starve out the Melians, who finally capitulate. And in punishment for not surrendering in the first place, the Athenian generals put to death every male citizen in Melos. And then they enslaved the women and the children, bro. They enslaved the women and the children. They killed all the men and enslaved the women and the children. Every citizen, every male citizen, every last one of them, bro. And I took you through that long exercise to understand it. Do you know at this very moment that every general that comes out of the United States Army, most Thucydides, and it's been over that. Every last one of them, every one of them, everybody that's been to Annapolis, everyone who's gone through the Marine Corps, this is an officer, and in the Navy. Well, I already said the Navy, Annapolis. In the Air Force, they all they all done read Thucydides, bro. They don't care about justice, man. To them, like these people are reading this shit, they might act like one way for the public, but you think these people really give a fuck about paying you something or doing right by you? I'm just keeping it 100. Well, we gonna get this and we need to make an appeal to that and we need to, you know, Talk about what's right and, and do you think they give a flying fuck about that? I'm just being honest. Because we keep that's the language we're using. We sound like the millions. It's just political realism, man. And this ain't got nothing to do with women, though. You know, a lot of times people think I'm contextualizing these conversations in a way that has something to do with women. This has shit to do with women right now. Nothing. This got to do with political reality. We already know that we were. I was never a slave. You were never a slave. None of us were born as slaves. But one could argue we still haven't been able to fully enjoy the privileges and the benefits and the rights that are associated with being an American citizen. We still suffer. We still at the bottom of the barrel. But one thing I can guarantee, I don't expect for these people to do a damn thing for us, man. To them, in their heads, I'm telling you how these people are probably thinking. They're thinking, look, we let you live. You can vote. You can go to the movies. Go buy you a pair of Jordans or some shit. We gave you freedom. This is what they're thinking. But y'all want some fucking reparation? You want what? You want what? You're lucky we let you live. (laughs) 
Now, I'm not saying that I agree with that, but I'm saying, how do you respond? Do you respond with justice language? Do you respond with a fucking march or protest? How do you respond to it? I'm telling you right now, every military officer reads this shit. Every politician worth his weight and salt has read this shit. What's good, Ru? What's good, team? So how do you respond politically yourself, knowing that this is how these people think? They don't care about your justice claim. They don't care about your talks about rights. You saw what happened after the civil rights movement. All the rights went to everybody, but the people was intended to go to. It went to everybody but us. And I'm talking about black men in particular. It went to everybody but us. They kicked that can down the road. Instead, we got a heavy dose of the criminal justice system. Everybody else been lifted up. We still getting pushed down. But I told you, I tried to tell you, social dominance theory, man. All this shit has always been from time immemorial. You can look at the history of mankind. It's always been about men fighting each other for resources and for territory. It's what it's been. It is what it is. And this is how they think. Most of them. Forget all that fluff shit you see on TV, MSNBC, all that. They, man, that's a bunch of smoke and mirrors, man. But the funny thing about this shit is, this is some global shit, man. These people don't fuck with people who are black throughout the entirety of the world, man. I mean, shit, they went into China. And China was at one point colonized. Now, they weren't able to stretch their tentacles deep off into it forever. But they went there. They went to India. So they done been in Asia and India, trust me. They done been to Africa. Shit, they in Australia. These motherfuckers say, we going everywhere. And they come with the idea, we doing what we want to, you gonna do what you can. Then you got a group of motherfuckers like, well, you know, Support a black woman president or some shit? Like, I mean, come on, man. Like, are you, we, we, we're not even being real about what the fuck is really going on. And even if we do have a woman black president, she's going to serve the geopolitical interest of these motherfuckers. She ain't going to serve the interest of the everyday man in America or man or woman. She gonna serve the interest of the elite, the powerful, whoever she is. Whoever gets in that damn house is gonna serve the interest of the power elite. Bottom line, man. And I'm just presenting this to you. I don't have to do this all night. I just wanted to get on and show you that so you can understand how these people think about power. They don't care about what's right. What's just? What's fair? They don't care about that. They do what they can. And they tell everybody else, do what you have to do. Please don't try to act honorable. We're going to slaughter you, man. 
This is the way they operate. This is like why we, I don't understand why we got to continue to go through the same kind of thinking. These people don't care, man. They're going to continue to do the same shit as long as they can hold on to power. They're not going to give it up. Power does not give itself up because you made an argument and convinced them to give it up. Have you ever seen a motherfucker do that? I've never seen it. T Fitness for you. Thank you for the donation, bro. Appreciate it. People don't just give up power, man. They have to be forced out of it. But you know one thing, and I've been saying this, and I, I just want people to understand it. If there is any chance, black people have to find some sort of way to unite and work collectively. But right now we're not in a mindset to work collectively because in fact, these people, they might not work collectively in every way, but there are certain ways that they do work collectively that's masterful, excuse me, masterful. Now I'm not saying all is lost, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to say, right now, man, we argue with each other over some stupid, petty bullshit, bro. We had our throats all day, every day. No strategy is every man for his damn, like kill the man with the ball. And you can't definitely overcome a power this immense being balkanized, separated and fragmented and having a whole bunch of divergent interests with no desire to do anything other than to capitulate. You got anything to say? I'm gonna lead the invite. And give you a quick minute to say it. Then after that, I'm out of here, man. Because it's, it's a Sunday night. It is a Sunday night. But I'm telling you, these people are not operating by the rules of justice and fairness. They're operating by the rules of power. And these are the very societies upon which the United States is patterned. European Western culture is patterned after Greek Athenian culture. It's patterned after Roman culture. You're talking about people, the stock of people who went in and conquered Rome. One of the most powerful empires in the entire world. They brought it to his knees. They're not, they're not the type of people to be like, okay, we're going to treat you fair. They, they don't run like that. They don't move like that. That's not how they operate. They operate by force and power. I got a guest coming in, Force Windu. What's good, my brother? How you doing, Force? Uh, peace to you, GJ. How you doing, brother? What's going on, man? How you doing? Hey, no, man. Just wanted to really just want to get on and give you a shout out and say thank you for your astounding work, man. This is why scholarship is needed in the manosphere. Off the show, bro. But you know, I just want to bring you things that you know you probably don't come into contact with on a day to day basis. You know what I'm saying? And I think that this debate, this is a famous debate. It, it is. And, and, you know, the irony is what you pointed out earlier is us in the manosphere particularly get caught up in minutia. You know, we, we have a common enemy in a sense, the system itself and <clears throat> understanding the history of the, 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 the system 
And uh, being able to articulate it the way you do, man, is, is special because when you study it, you get a chance to understand your enemy better. And I, and I say enemy in the sense that there is nothing good about, like what you talked about, everything that was done to those people is being done systematically to us. Oh, and yeah. historically, I mean, it's just been that way. So if you study your enemy, you understand his tactics, you can better defend against it if there is a defense. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. But at least you got to know what you're up against. See, this is what the Asians do expertly. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Their enemy. They know who their enemy is. They know their enemy like they know themselves. They ask questions. They study this culture. Facts. And mm -hmm. and our, you know, in the scriptures it says that our people are killed for a lack of knowledge. And um, and then and that's that's what we have. We have a we've been dumbed down intentionally, and and just run them up, let us stray, <laughs> bamboozle. <laughs> I hear you, man. But listen, I'm gonna get off. I just want listen Sunday night. I just wanted to get on. Tell you thank you for your work. It's astounding. I, I really appreciate the scholarly approach that you've been taking to your work, and a damn sure love when you go silverback, bro. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Right now, I'm just trying to tell, bro. Thank you, brother. Appreciate stay on, bro. Stay up. All right, stay up, bro. Peace. Yeah. So I mean, you know. My man says, uh, I appreciate how you're articulating, but my question is, brother, knowing all that, how these people operate, what is the best strategy? And let me just say this. I can't, I can't be the person to come up with the only strategy, but we're going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow. But, I mean, ultimately, I can't be a fool, man, to be on Facebook or, like, YouTube talking about like um, uh, uh, in, that's like me being at the fucking Super Bowl, like telling the the, the commentator like exactly what the playbook is. I, you know, I, but all I'm telling you is I can tell you what the, the strategy can't be. The strategy cannot be, and you glean it from the process of elimination. It can't be begging for some shit. It, it can't be that. <laughs> you know, you can't be asking these people like, well. You know, you're not fair. You need to be more fair. Like, when does that ever work? You're talking about the people. You're talking about people, man, who conquer Rome. You're talking about a group of people who tortured their own people, like the Iron Maiden, the Pyramid. The cage. I don't have a website, bro. I do not. I do not have a website. But that goes for you, uh, Jay Yeti. I don't have a website, but it, I might be getting one soon. But I do have a Patreon page. You can visit me at the Patreon page. You have to look at my member. Uh, just look at the YouTube uh, page, and then look at the welcome video, and then you'll be able to see where all the uh, sites that you can reach me at. So I'm just trying to let you know how these people think. And they might tell you one thing, but what they really think is a motherfucker. Look at look at my man Raiz, man. What's up with you, bro? I ain't look, I ain't seen you in a whole month of Sundays, bro. I ain't seen you in a minute. But, you know, the, the one thing that really befuddles my brain, it just confuses me, man. It, uh, and I hate to say this shit, man, I, because I, I don't. I just, you know, I, it just befuddles my brain how naive we are politically, man. It just, it just, it just befuddles my brain. I just don't understand how we are this naive. And it would be different if there weren't African American people who fucking told all of this shit, who came up with all of this before. 
It'd be different if you didn't have Kwame Turi, you didn't have Malcolm X, you didn't have Fred Hampton, you didn't have Huey P. Newton, you didn't have Farrakhan. You, it'd be different if you weren't given all of this information already. And I ain't saying, man, you know, black people, man, we feel like we're in heaven, man. But our ancestors had it a little harder than we got it. But we got it a little bit harder than they got it in some ways. Because now we think we've overcome, but we really have not. We're the laughing stock of the damn world. Can't get right. No, no unity. No plan, no strategy, no culture that's our own that we're using in order to unite our distant cousins and the device of pain to ameliorate our condition, man. And it saddens me. It ups it, it, it just it disappoints me. It just disappoints me, man. And this is look, my, my man Meanies Optara says most of us don't know the history. And we don't. Most people don't know history in general. The one thing I know for having taught at the university level. Upwards of 10 years, man, is that most of these kids don't understand their own history. Like white people don't understand their history either. You ask them, like, name three Supreme Court justices. Well, you know, um, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know. Name me the main, name me three characters in Jersey Shore. They can they can name all them, but they can't give you the name of three Supreme Court justices. They can't. They don't even know who Clarence Thomas is. Scalia is. They don't know who R. B. G. is, and she just died. The Ginsburg lady. We better get right, man. All I'm saying is we better get our shit right, man. We better get our shit right. We have a long tradition to draw back upon, man. And we don't even know that tradition. I hear a lot of people, you know, talk about ADOS, ADOS, ADOS. We don't even study ADOS. That's the terrible thing, man. Like Carter G. Woodson wrote a book, The Miseducation of the Negro, man. <laughs> we got to read it. We have to read it to understand what he's trying to articulate. We don't read W.E.B. Du Bois. We don't read our own thinkers, man. But it's imperative that we study. It's imperative that we do learn and develop our minds, because we're up against a, 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 a humongous challenge. I'm not saying all of us don't read it, James. Some of, some of us read, some of us are on it. But we gotta read it and teach it. We gotta read it and teach it. We got to become more culturally astute. See, there's a young brother, man, that asked me a question in my comment section, and he basically asked me the question, like, well, why don't y'all, the OGs, why don't y'all pass the torch to us? Why don't y'all teach us some shit? Why don't y'all, like, give us the game? Or Because we have nothing to pass on to them. We haven't worked out a system where we can give them game. Sometimes. You got a group of men who will do that. 
but we don't hand them over game. We don't have a, a institution, a set of practices to let them know what to, to avoid. The manosphere is beginning to do that. But we need to be vigilant and, and better about that. And let them know the pitfalls of relationships, the pitfalls of dealing with the system, the police, the educational system. We need to have them ready to know what these pitfalls are. We need to stop the self-hating, man, turning and folding in on each other. Look at my man, Laura Faye, to say, <laughs> as soon as niggas start reading, all they're going to do is bitch and argue about the doctrine instead of branding, uh, banding together against our oppressors. And you know what? I think you're right. But you know what I also think? I think that there'll never be consensus. When you got generals together in a war room, they're never in complete agreement. Never. Not in complete agreement. But they know that they got a common and a collective purpose, and so they go, and they improvise from there. And that's what's important. So anyway, man, I got a show tomorrow. We're going to be talking about strategy. I'm going to be talking to a person who has been in the military as a uh, an officer. And he's going to be giving us concepts that the military uses in relation to developing campaigns and logistics and strategies and how they come from the top and how they filter down. And how Everybody has a different role or purpose to play or to perform in the context of a military campaign. And they don't all operate knowing everything that everyone else knows about how to fulfill or to carry out the plans of the campaign. They just know what they need to do and they do what they're supposed to do. And if they get cut off, then there has to be improvisation on how to recoup from that loss. But the dance goes on, the campaign goes on. But having said all that, man, it is a Sunday night. It is my time, 11.42. I just wanted to hit you with this blessing right quick because it was on my mind to give it to you. Hopefully you could go back and see the way these people, not all of them, because you got different kinds of white people too, but the whole point is in, con in the context of European culture, which is very much warlike, as you can tell, <laughs> you'll understand some of the ways that they think and how they view conflict and how they view how they should treat people who don't have as much power as they do. It's just something to look forward to, man. Just something to think about, man. So now you have the, the Melian debate at your at, at your fingertips. All, all you got to do is grasp at it with a click. Peace out, y'all, man. I'm about to get up on out here, man. Y'all be good, brothers and sisters if you're out there. Peace.
ever drink some coke mixed with some Hennessy. Better yet, you remind me of a dubstep that ain't got no seeds. Now come.